And of course, Paul will be signing copies of his book uh, following the program, right outside, make it very convenient for you, right, out, right outside the studio. So. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Newsam's Night TV studio and another edition of Inside Media. I'm your host, John Maynard. Uh, well, America's love affair with the car goes back over a century ago when the first Model T rolled off the assembly line in 1908. Indeed, America's history is a vehicular history, and clearly it has been ingrained in our culture. Only in America could there exist not one, but two television shows about a talking car. Knight Rider and My Mother the Car, <laughs> and let's not forget Herbie the Love Bug in the movies. Um, the new book, Engines of Change, offers a history of the American dream in 15 cars from the Model T to the Prius. Along the way, the book explores how cars have both propelled and reflected the American experience and looks at some of the unintended consequences of the automobile. We are joined today by the book's author, Paul Ingracia. Paul is currently Deputy Editor-in-Chief of Reuters. Uh, prior to that, he served as president of Dow Jones Newswires and was the Detroit bureau chief for the Wall Street Journal, a newspaper where he worked for 31 years. Uh, he won the Pulitzer Prize in 1993 for reporting on management crises at General Motors. He is also the author of the book Crash Course, the American automobile industry's road from glory to disaster. So clearly, this man knows his cars. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Paul Ingracia. Uh, Paul, first, let's, let's make clear that this book is not a list of the 15 greatest cars or the 15 best-selling cars. Tell us what these 15 cars represent to you. Well, that's exactly right, John. You know, there's been a lot of uh, books done about the 10 greatest cars of all time and whatever, and um, I honestly think that whatever I know about automobiles, I would not be qualified to write a book like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, uh, I really wanted to look at cars that had an impact on how we live and think as a people. Uh, so, in some of these cars, I mean, notably the Chevy Corvair, which was an awful car. Uh, I mean, it had a tendency to spin out around the corners because all the weight was in the back end. That's where the engine was and all that. Uh, and it made Ralph Nader famous. It, um, it created the, really the greatest growth industry of the late 20th century, which is called lawsuits. Um, <laughs> you know, so uh, it's, it's not a good car, but it's a hugely influential car in our history. Mm -hmm. And we'll, we'll get into uh, Mr. Nader for, for sure as we, we go on, but I mentioned the American love affair. Is, is, the, is the love affair with the car stronger than ever? Uh, has it changed over the last century, century and a half? Well, uh, you know, it's, that's, that's a great question, and the answer is it's probably not stronger than ever because mm. people don't need automobiles to do a lot of the things they used to do. I mean, it used to be, um, you know, uh, something to get away, you know, your, it was your freedom. You could, you know, get away from... Uh, your, your, your life and all that. You can go on the internet and get away from your life and have a, an imaginary experience today. But it's still your, your physical mobility. I mean, one of the most remarkable things, this is not in America, but it's a, it's a global example. Uh, in 1989, after the Berlin Wall fell um, and East Germans got real money for the first time, the, what they did is went out and bought used West German cars instead of the crappy little commie Trabants they used to have, okay? And you couldn't buy a, a used car in Western Germany for two years because it was their freedom. People could mm -hmm. finally go where they wanted to go. Mm -hmm. right. So it's, it's and, and the biggest area for car growth, uh, car sales growth today are developing economies, China. Mm -hmm. So clearly uh, there's something universal about the, the desire for personal mobility. Right. Now, are, do you consider yourself a, a car fan or fanatic or? Uh, uh, you know, I, I, I'm fascinated by sort of the ins and outs of how they make them mm -hmm. and what they represent culturally. Um, what, what I like about uh, writing about the automobiles and the automobile industry is you can use it to sort of slice into a lot of really interesting, <coughs> excuse me, big topics. Um, things like uh, globalization, um, uh, culture, uh, you know, technology, environmental issues, mm -hmm. uh, labor management relations, design, and all that. So there's a lot of huge sort of big picture issues that you can use to sort of slice into through this industry. That's what engages me about it. Um, well, let's, uh, let's start looking at some of the, the cars that are featured in the book, and, and uh, we'll start with uh, the Model T, if our PowerPoint's working there, and that's uh, Henry Ford in that picture there, I believe. That's uh, right, that's Henry Ford and actually Edsel Ford the first, right, his son. Right. Yep. And um, the, the Model T uh, ruled the roads for tw 20 years uh, from its unveiling in 1908. You write in, in the book that the car represented the mm -hmm. ultimate in automotive evolution, uh, yet he was reluctant to modernize. Is that, is that 
Is that true um, during the, the, the reign of the Model T? Well, reluctant doesn't begin to describe <laughs> it. As a, as a matter of fact, there was one period, uh, the Model T was introduced, to, you know, as you said, John, in 1908. Uh, sometime in the mid-teens, uh, he went on an extended vacation to Europe. He was world famous and all that sort of thing, incredibly wealthy. He came back to find out that his, um, some of his employees had produced a new, a totally new version of the Model T that was very, you know, much more attractive and racy and all that sort of thing. And he got so angry, he tore the car apart with his <laughs> bare hands. I mean, employee initiative was not, <laughs> yeah. was not well represented there, let's put it that way. Uh, but this was the car that really put America on wheels. It was not the cheapest car uh, in America. When it came out, it was about $850. Uh, the cheapest car at that time was something called the, the Brush Everyman's Car. It was made of wood, and the, the, the line about it during its day was uh, wooden axle, wooden wheels, wooden run, okay? <laughs> so, um, and that was about $500. <laughs> but, but um, you know, if you, if you step back away from automobiles, American culture is sort of this big yin-yang between the practical and the pretentious, the upscale, the downscale. And this car lasted for 20 years because it was all about practicality. Mm -hmm. But by the, the late 1920s, people wanted more status and style and that sort of thing. And that's why the Model T was finally uh, discontinued in 1920, 1927, just a couple of years before the stock market crash. Mm -hmm. You mentioned you know, Henry Ford was very reluctant to modernize. Did that affect the course of the auto industry going forward, the fact that he was? Well, absolutely, because it opened, it opened the uh, door for General Motors to pass Ford. What happened was is that um, you know, Ford had about two-thirds of all the cars in the world you know, in the early 1920s. By that time, the price of a Model T was down to $260. Mm. But you know, the Model T was a, 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 an automobile for physical mobility. What, what people also eventually wanted cars for more and more as the 20s moved on was social mobility mm -hmm. to express their status in life and, and all that sort of thing. And so it just, it, it really, uh, uh, it just really outlived its time in a way. General Motors had a different idea. It was this hierarchy of brands. Cars were vehicles for self-expression. Mm -hmm. right. uh, well, let's jump ahead a few decades. Uh, and since speaking of status, so we can move to the, the Chevy Corvette. Uh, now, this is. Can you listen to all the sighs from the audience yeah. <laughs> when you put that thing up there? Yeah, these pictures are terrific. <laughs> right. um, now, this is actually a 1963 model, uh, but um, the, right. the car itself was introduced in uh, 1953. Uh, right. And you, you note that that is a watershed year in American history when it comes to our culture. Uh, did the car reflect the culture or did the car help change uh, the culture in the 1950s? Well, a little bit of both. Yeah. It's sort of a chicken and egg question. But right. 53, if you look at 1953, it was the year that the Korean War ended. It was the year that Hugh Hefner started Playboy. It was the year that Elvis restarted his musical recording career. Uh, the year that Eisenhower went to the White House and, and young uh, uh, Congressman Jack Kennedy went to the U.S. Senate. Um, so th it, uh, you had a picture of a country that was, you know, and people had grown up, they knew privation, they knew war, and people wanted to let loose a little bit. We had peace, we had prosperity, and along comes this car. Now this is a later version of mm -hmm. it, but the, the first version was very attractive, but it was a disaster. Mm -hmm. It was slow, uh, it had an anemic six-cylinder engine, uh, it had a terrible little two-speed automatic transmission. The roof leak that people actually used to drill holes in the floor of their <laughs> Corvettes to, to drain it. But, you know, GM was actually ready to kill this car after two years on the market, less than two years. And a, a Russian engineer, immigrant engineer, who was raised a Bolshevik boy in St. Petersburg, he had, you know, grown up and <clears throat> been born in 1909, wrote this impassioned letter to senior management. He wanted to save the car, and they let him do it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, if Senator Joe McCarthy, you know, that was the height of the Red Scare, if he would have known that a Bolshevik boy saved that car, I don't think, I don't think it would be the great American icon that it, that it is. And this car actually was problematic too, from what I understand. This is the 1963 ver version, that's something to do with the, was it the windows? Or yeah, that's yeah. the only year of the split rear window, which right. makes these very collectible today. <laughs> if any of you got a, you know, four or five hundred grand you want to spare on one of these things, you can get one. Uh, but the, uh, there was a fight between the GM design department and the GM engineering department. Um, uh, Zora Arkas Duntoff, the, you know, the Russian engineer who basically saved the car, did not want that split window, mm -hmm. but he lost the battle that year to the stylist. So. Right. There you go. Well, we've got to talk about the, uh, the Cadillac, and this is a 1959 yes, model. Right. <laughs> as you aptly ask in the book. They don't book, make cars like that anymore. <laughs> <do they? laughs> well, and as Paul aptly asked in the book, 
about the Finns, what were we thinking? And uh, yes, right. what were we thinking, uh, Paul? What were the designers thinking anyway? Well, you know, this is the this is the epitome. This is the '59 Cadillac Eldorado Biarritz, which had the um, the biggest tail fins of all time, and it's a remarkable automobile. I mean, it's all about the space age. Even aside from the fins, you can see the side of that car, the fuselage, uh, sort of a fuselage look, if you will, like a rocket ship. Yep. Um, but the uh, the history of these things actually is remarkable. They came out as small little things in 1948. By the mid-50s, though, Chrysler, which was really lagging in market share, the company was not doing well, decided to start put, put uh, bigger fins on its cars uh, and actually marketed its tail fins, believe it or not, as safety devices. Uh, the exact term in the old sales brochures, and I sort of uncovered this in the, the bowels of the Detroit Public Library, they have all these old sales brochures from over the years, was graceful directional stabilizers. I mean, okay. <laughs> What can I, what can yeah, I say? Yeah, right, right. Uh, so General Motors, actually, what happened is a young designer named Chuck Jordan, uh, who actually just died a couple of years ago, I, I had the privilege to interview him before he passed away. It was the summer of 1957, and he heard rumors what Chrysler was doing with its new models, and he drove around behind a Chrysler facility, saw these big tail fins. He ran back into his boss's office at the GM Design Center and said, we're about to get out finned. Okay. <laughs> And so this was really, they weren't out to make a social statement, it was just about a competitive response. When, when Chuck did the first version of this car, on the clay model version before it came out, uh, he stepped back and looked at it and he realized that the tail fins were actually taller than the roof line of the car. So what you see there is actually the scaled down fins. <laughs> right, right, unbelievable. Um, let's move ahead and uh, we'll, we'll go to the, uh, the Volkswagen. Oh, uh, right, yes. Uh, is that the anti-Cadillac or not? Yeah. <laughs> okay. And we'll talk about the ad tagline in a second, but this was a, a car favored by Adolf Hitler. Absolutely. And yep. how did Hitler's car become the car of the hippie generation? Well, it's, it's a remarkable <laughs> automotive journey. Um, the, um, uh, for, the, for Hitler's car, which literally, he, it was created by Ferdinand Porsche, but it was, its sponsor was, it was Adolf Hitler. Uh, and only a few of these actually were made before the war because when World War II started, uh, the factory was turned into a, a, a military procurement factory. Uh, but then production began after the war. Actually, um, both um, Ford Motor Company and um, uh, British Leyland were offered, offered a chance to, buy, uh, to have the Volkswagen factory, not, not to buy it, but to be given the company for free, and both turned it down. Um, so it sort of struggled on as an independent company uh, but then, you know, there's some f what happened was there were a few GIs were over in Germany. They drove these cars. They liked them. They were cheap and easy and uh, very reliable, and they brought them back, and then they started to catch on here, really. Um, and again, there was no social statement. The reason Volkswagen exported these cars to the U.S. to begin with is they needed American dollars, hard currency, to buy uh, production machinery. Mm -hmm. But what, what really changed this into the hippie car was it really a couple things. First of all, Again, back to the practical versus the pretentious. I mean, if you wanted to make an anti-conspicuous consumption statement mm -hmm. after those Cadillacs on the road, this was the car, obviously, for you. Mm -hmm. And then there's this offbeat advertising. I mean, there were, um, uh, you know, Lemon. Who declared their car to be a Lemon, right. right? You read the text and it says, well, wait a minute, we caught this one before it got off the assembly line and onto the dealer lot. Right. But even other things were remarkable. They did an ad, um, in the, uh, in the mid-60s, they did an ad showing Wilt Chamberlain, uh, a <laughs> b basketball player, you yeah. know, seven foot, one inch tall. One of the first ads actually to feature a black person in an ad, an African-American person. And he's standing there trying to get into the car, and the headline is, uh, they said it couldn't be done. It couldn't. <laughs> okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was just remarkable. The other ad on the microbus, um, oh, yeah. and it just goes to show you what the classic, you know, they were very irreverent and witty. They had an empty microbus with all the doors and windows open, and the headline was, this is 1963, mind you, do you have the right kind of wife for it? <laughs> okay. Hey. I mean, could you imagine an ad like yeah, that right, today? Right, right, right. <laughs> wow, wow. Um, I do want to show now a, a photo of, uh, you guys all know what this will be when we see it. Great ad, by the way. Um, the uh, Ford is Mustang. The is that the cheesiest car ad you've it's ever seen? Very cheesy. <laughs> very cheesy. Uh, 1964. How did this car uh, transform itself to quote a Ford executive from a librarian to a sex pot? Well, the, the, the Mustang basically it was a it was a beautiful car, and it really caught America by storm. I mean, this was a car that um, 
really caught America's baby boom generation, the largest generation, just as it was coming of age, a very critical time in this generation's life. I mean, either getting your driver's license, going off to college. But the truth is, this car was just a very sexy, attractive body style put on top of the chassis of one of the most boring cars of all time, Robert McNamara's car, by the way, mm -hmm. the Ford Falcon, which McNamara championed before he went to the Pentagon. Mm -hmm. um, so what a, when a Detroit, Detroit Free Press reporter later went in after, the, after this car was setting all kinds of new sales records, they, he went in to do an interview and one of the senior Ford executives um, said, I want to explain to you how we did this car. He said, you take a, you take a woman, okay, and you, you, know, you, you put her hair up in a bun, you, you, know, you flatten out her chest, you flatten out her behind, you put her in sneakers, and what do you have? You have the school librarian. And now you take that same woman and you let her hair down, you, know, you pat out her chest and her behind, you put her in spike heels, and you have a sex pot. That's what we did to a car. Mm -hmm. Now, any executive that gave an interview <laughs> in those terms today would probably be hauled down to the HR department right. and right. You know, fired quickly, right. but Absolutely. Absolutely. that's how we explained it. Yeah. Um, when a certain generation hears the name John DeLorean, they think of the uh, scandals and might think of the 1980s car in Back to the Future, of course, right, but um, right. it was DeLorean who fathered the uh, Pontiac GTO, uh, which, as you write, right. was all about rebellion. Um, uh, this also, repre this also repre represented the height of um, DeLorean's career. Uh, tell us about his career. We can talk about the car also, but talk about DeLorean himself, his career, and you know, how it ended. <laughs> well, yeah, he was a, actually a brilliant guy, basically. He, um, his, his insight really was to put a hot engine in what at that time was a very small car that was considered small for its day, uh, which was the Pontiac Tempest. Um, and, uh, you know, the GM corporate brass wanted to kill the car. It violated the corporation's rules, actually, about having a big engine in a little car. Uh, but he sort of snuck around them because he, he, he made this really just an optional equipment item on a instead of a standard, standard new car. Uh, this was in 1964, the same year the Mustang was introduced, by the way. Mm. And uh, it, sales took off. I mean, it, 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 this, was, this was about a different kind of rebel than the Volkswagen Beetle type rebels. Right. I mean, these people didn't want to raise, GTO drivers, by and large, didn't want to raise consciousness. They wanted to raise hell, you know? <laughs> um, uh, so, and if you look at the 60s, I mean, this is the, it's sort of two parts of the 60s, really. You know, John is the, the first half is sort of the good half, where you had, it was all about, you know, civil rights, and it was about the, uh, the Beatles and the Mustang, and then things got a little awry, and the latter half were about urban riots and the, and the Rolling Stones, not the Beatles, and the GTO. So this really was the, the, the rebel hot rider car of its day. Right. And tell us about a little, just a brief summary of DeLorean's career following, you know, that, as well, I said, he, that was sort of the zenith of his career. Yeah, it was. Yeah. He basically, he left General Motors in the early 1970s, about 73, and he resigned, uh, and basically it was this myth of, this is the guy that fired GM, the truth was really the opposite. Mm -hmm. uh, but he um, went on to start his own car company, the DeLorean car company, that made this car in Northern Ireland with huge government subsidies, by the way, granted by Margaret Thatcher's government, mm -hmm. remarkable, mar remarkably. I think they wanted to get the people in Northern Ireland building anything besides bombs, so they said, you know, we'll right. subsidize a car factory. Uh, but everything went awry. I mean, basically, they, he lost all the money. There were lawsuits, and um, he tried to save the company. You know, most people would have used junk bonds or an IPO. Uh, DeLorean tried selling cocaine, um, right. novel thing. And he was right. captured on camera, but he was acquitted uh, when the jury refused to acquit him. Right. He died at age 80, just about... Um, uh, well, he, he died in the town I live now, Summit, New Jersey, where mm -hmm. Susie and I live at, uh, about uh, three years ago. Okay. Another main player uh, in, in the book, of course, in, in the car industry in general, is Lee Iacocca, um, right. who, uh, after being unceremoniously dumped from Ford, uh, revised the fortune of, of Chrysler. How, how did he go about doing that? Well, you know, Iacocca was, uh, ran, a, ran a foul of Henry Ford and basically took over Chrysler in 1979, just as the company was on the brink of bankruptcy. Um, and he, what he did was he, he cut the heck out of costs. I mean, you know, they had 45 vice presidents. There were maybe 10 left by the end of his first mm -hmm. year um, and that sort of thing. So he cut costs, but he also, uh, you know, ironically championed small cars, which had never been a really a, 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 a forte of him, of his. Um, he also had a guy, a, a real a certifiable product genius working with him who had also been fired from Ford Motor Company named Hal Spurlick. Mm -hmm. So he and Hal had basically been the two of the key figures behind the Mustang that caught the baby boom generation, you know, coming of age. 
exactly 20 years later in 1984, they were both at Chrysler and they caught the baby boom generation at another mm -hmm. critical junction of their lives, uh, the child rearing years, mm -hmm. and they introduced this thing called the minivan. Right. Um, and so you had these people who had, you know, grown up and gone to college and, you know, gotten a haircut and gotten a job and all that sort of thing. And, and uh, it was, a, again, just the perfect time in their lives for this new kind of vehicle. Uh, another big name that gets almost his own chapter is uh, uh, Ralph Nader. Uh, oh, yes. Ralph right. Nader on the cover of Time Magazine, I believe in 1969, if I have that correct. Um, uh, and we, we, we kind of referred to that in the opening, but his fame can be tied to the Chevy Clavier. Tell Absolutely. us about his crusade uh, against, that, against that car and, well, when, and why he took it up. You know, it's really, it's, it's quite interesting. Uh, Ten years before this, uh, this cover of Time appeared, in 1959, the cover of Time had a guy named Ed Cole on it. And Ed Cole was a, really a genius engineer, um, but not, not known for his humility, created the Corvair. Okay. And, um, you know, going back and rereading that story about the, uh, when he in introduced the Corvair in the fall of 59, uh, the lead paragraphs, he, he, told the, he told the Time reporter, he said, if I was any more proud of our new Chevy Corvair, I think I'd blow up. Okay. <laughs> yeah. What can I, I say? Yeah. Uh, so five years later, uh, you know, Ralph Nader writes this book called Unsafe at Any Speed. Uh, and it, all, it described how the Corvair, with all that weight in the rear end, it was like the Beetle, you know, rear, rear engine, air-cooled engine. Uh, but it was much longer than the Beetle. And it tended to spin out around corners. And there were lots and lots of accidents. So Nader writes his book, basically, uh, the book is a flop. Mm. But then it comes out, first in the New Republic magazine, which no one, frankly, noticed, but then in the New York Times, picked up the New Republic allegations, that Nader had been spied on by private detectives hired, um, hired by General Motors. Uh, Jim Roach, the president of the GM, came down to hearings before the Ribicoff Committee at the time, uh, apologized publicly to Nader before Congress with all the TV net network cameras going, mm. Nader, ironically, missed the apology. He didn't have a car and he couldn't get a cab that morning, so <laughs> I mean, you couldn't make it up. But, uh, but anyway, uh, it made Nader, Nader an overnight celebrity and it really changed the whole um, attitude of the U.S. government toward re regulating industry, not just the auto industry, but every industry. And the whole era of regulation accelerated after that. It also redefined product liability law and the ultimate um, evolution of the litigation on the Corvair in the 1960s came in 1995 with the McDonald's hot coffee case. Mm. Um, all the legal precedents set in that, uh, that were in that hot coffee case were set by the Corvair. I'm going to get to two more cars and then we do want to uh, hear from our audience. So if you have a question, please uh, get ready to raise your hand and our staffers will come to you. But let's move to the Beamer. Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> uh, what attracted yuppies in the 1980s to the to the BMW. <laughs> well, yeah, the Beamer was the yuppie car, and uh, the, the title of the, the chapter in the book uh, is um, uh, the BMW 3 Series, the, the Rise of the Yuppies and the Road to Arugula. Um, I <laughs> think you get it, right? Yeah. Uh, so uh, the, what, what, the Beetle was all about luxury. I mean, you know, baby boomers were kind of, in one way, like their parents in the 50s. They wanted status. On the other hand, um, what they, they, they had a different view of luxury. It was all about functional luxury as opposed to ostentatious ornamental luxury. And BMWs had, you know, tight, you know, road hugging suspension and all that sort of thing. I mean, these were the same people going out and buying, you know, vibration damping Rosignol skis and all that kind of, you know, high, you know, remember those first steel tennis rackets and how awful those were and all that kind of stuff. Uh, what, was, what was the fun part of that chapter actually was, um, uh, it was a couple things. One is that um, in, in doing my interviews with, for the book, I, I met some people who were in their 60s, they were in their college hippie years um, and driving Beatles. And 20 years later, in the 80s, they're in their yuppie years as corporate lawyers driving BMWs. <laughs> so it was like they had these personal journeys from you know, hippie to yuppie and this automotive journey from Beetle to Beamer. I mean, you couldn't yeah. quite make it up. Um, the other thing that you know is, is, is was not a, not a, not revealed by me, but the history of this company is remarkable, and it's not widely known. Um, uh, the Quant family really saved this company from extinction in the late '50s, when it was about to be absorbed by Mercedes-Benz. Uh, and there were two half brothers, Harold, who was legally blind, couldn't even drive a car, um, and I mean, uh, that, sorry, that was Herbert Herbert Quant, 
And Harold was actually the stepson of Joseph Goebbels, a rather notorious figure in history. So. Wow, wow. Yeah. Isn't there a funny anecdote? That's not in the BMW brochures. Oh, right, no. no. <laughs> funny anecdote in, the, in this chapter. Uh, someone crashed their BMW into a, a restaurant with the name Arugula. Arugula, right. right. It's, it right. happened in Boulder, Colorado. Yeah. And, you, and you couldn't make that right, up exactly, either. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> right. Um, we'll go to the, uh, the final chapter, uh, we'll, we'll take us, takes us up to modern day, deals with the Prius, uh, which you can say, which as you say, really lets their owners wear their greenness on their sleeve. Um, is the, and that's uh, the Toyota president, I believe, Hiroshi Okuda. Um, yeah, that's Mr. Okuda. Yeah. And that's when the Prius was introduced in, uh, in uh, Tokyo back in 1997. It did not come to the U.S. till three years later. And it was sort of a middling thing. I mean, the first generation Prius was ugly, but in, in 2003, uh, two things that happened that really made it take off. One is they restyled it and it was much bigger and it was also very distinctive styling. I mean, you know, I don't think it's very attractive, but it, it was so distinctive that people, everyone knew you were driving a hybrid. Mm -hmm. And the other thing was that Hollywood caught on to this, sure. basically. In the, Osc the 2003 Oscars, I mean, all these stars who used to pull up in the big limos were just like crawling over themselves to be driven up to the red carpet in a Prius. And Toyota donated the Priuses and all of a sudden you know, these people got out and they were devoted to the environment along with, you know, impossibly white teeth and whatever, and there, here they are, you know. So, and that's what made the Prius really take off. Um, one, of the, um, one of the fun things I, I ran across in doing the research for this book, in, in March of 2007, there's a guy arrested on the freeway in California in the Bay Area going more than 100 miles an hour in his Prius. Mm -hmm. And this comes to the attention of the uh, newspaper columnist for the San Jose, the, the uh, automotive columnist for the San Jose Mercury News, writes a column called Mr. Roadshow. And he was really, he hopped on the story because the guy who was arrested was Steve Wozniak, who's co-founder, of course, of Apple Computer. So he shoots off this email to the Woz and says, is it true you were arrested for going 100 and, 105 in your Prius? And Wozniak shoots back an email, says, not true. 104, okay? <laughs> right, right. And then there's this great on-log dialogue that takes place, and Mr. Roadshow says, well, how did it feel? How did the Prius handle at 104 miles an hour? How did this feel? And uh, Wozniak sends back an email, said, you know, it really wasn't bad. It was better than I expected. It handled almost as well as my Hummer. <laughs> so, I mean, here you, here you have this guy that's got a Prius and a Hummer, so it's... <laughs> You know, it, I don't know how you make sense out of that it was one. There's also a great, uh, and you mentioned it in the book, a Curb Your Enthusiasm episode dealing with Larry David. He's a Prius owner, and he thinks right. he can salute other Prius owners, and the guy doesn't salute him back or something like that. And, yeah, uh, and, he, uh, and he takes that after the uh, right. Prius and runs into a dog, and yeah, it's right, all. Right, 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 right. It was, my other favorite thing about the Prius, though, is that uh, in the Portland Mercury, uh, it's a weekly newspaper, in the 2008 presidential election, they had this, one of the writers had a great line. He said, uh, you drive a Prius, you compost, you recycle, and you have reusable shopping bags for your short drive to Whole Foods. Right. So, do we really need the Obama sticker? <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Um, if, if there are any questions, please just uh, raise your hand. Uh, and, uh, oh, we have one right down there in the second row. I, be, and before we get to the question, I, you, you brought up Obama. I, I, quick, right. quick politics question before we get to the question. Um, how big of an issue will it become, uh, looking at the, the, the bailout of General Motors? Um, there was an editorial cartoon in the Washington Post that referred to that today, actually. Um, oh. Will it be something Obama plays up in the fact that Romney you know, opposed the bailout? Well, I think it will. And I think what's more important about that is it'll be played up in, uh, in a state, Ohio, that is, uh, I think, I mean, look, there's people out in this audience, you know, um, that are, you know, Dan Balls and Roger Simon and other great political reporters out here who know the crucial states more than I do. But if, if uh, Ohio is going to be a critical state, that will resonate, I suspect, in, in the state of Ohio. Okay, so we'll... Hi. Um, I wanted to ask a related question about your thoughts on the bailout and then what you foresee as the next chapter of where, the, where cars are going in this country. Thank you. Well, let, let me take them in reverse order if I can. So, um, you know, people have asked me, um, if you were going to put a 16th car in the book, what would you, what would you do? Or what, if you write the book a decade from now, what, what car would be in the book? And I'm not even sure it would be a car, to be honest with you. I mean, it might be uh, a concept like Zipcar, which is sort of this, you know, sharing. And you all know Zipcar. And, you know, I just sort of wonder if, if someone's going to create a concept, you know, you, should, you sort of combine social networking uh, with automobiles. I mean, is there going to be a, a, a merger of eHarmony with Zipcar? And we're going to have eHarmonyZipcar.com? 
I, I don't know, but you know, it, it could be that, or it could be these driverless cars that are now being invented, you know, Google's working on them, so your car will not be something that you have to really pay attention to. If you have a driverless car, you can text, you can party, you can drink, and just think of all the avenues that opens, I mean, right? So, um, you know, as far as the, the, uh, the bailout goes, I mean, look, I think, um, uh, I don't think the president wanted to do this. I mean, um, you know, it was one of those things like, um, um, you know, frankly, like changing a diaper, you know, you got to hold your nose and do it sometimes. Um, but if you put yourself in his position back in, you know, right after he took office in early 2009, when the American economy was shedding hundreds of thousands of jobs every month, and you had um, the prospect of General Motors and Chrysler just, you know, being liquidated, and there really was no other choice but liquidation here, frankly, if, if there wouldn't have been government money to, uh, uh, come forth. So, you know, I think he, he did something he had to do, even though ideologically I don't think um, he, he wanted to do it, but he had to do it. Uh, let me ask you a question then. Uh, you write the hardest part about writing this book was deciding mm. what cars to leave out. Um, you know, you just mentioned that. But can you tell us some of those cars that may have, that may have made that? We're on the cusp and just didn't make the cut. Uh, sure, John. I mean, I think one was the AMC Gremlin. I don't know how many people here have <laughs> memory, fond or otherwise memories yeah. of that. But, but look, nothing quite symbolized. Uh, I mean, the 70s were not a great period in America. We had, um, uh, you know, we had Watergate. We had defeat in Vietnam. Uh, we had two oil crises. We had stagflation. You know, we had bell-bottom pants and all kinds of, <laughs> all kinds of bad stuff. So. Uh, and nothing quite symbolized the futility of the Jimmy Carter years, I don't think, is that car. I mean, it was actually um, introduced uh, on April Fool's Day, 1970. Uh, it was sketched out, the design was first sketched out by a guy named Dick Teague at American Motors uh, on the back of a Northwest Airlines air sickness bag. Um, so it was appropriate in all kinds of ways, right. but didn't, didn't quite make the cut. Um, the, um, you know, another, you know, people said, what about the 57 Chevy? But, and that was a great car for driving and the car industry and for General Motors and all that. But I don't think it really captured that sky's the limit exuberance of the 50s, uh, the way tail fins became so symbolic, if you will. Uh, the Ford Taurus in the um, late, in the mid 80s sort of was a, a big car for the industry again, but there's no lasting cultural resonance of the Ford Taurus. And you, you do have it in this book, and I don't have it on the screen, but the pickup, the, the, the pickup did, when did the pickup enter into the kind of the American cultural mainstream? Uh, well, pickups actually um, existed really from almost the beginning of the auto industry. In fact, you know, you could buy a Ford Model T version, but it really wasn't a pickup. It was, you bought a pickup bed separately, and you bought the, bought the Model T front end and chassis, and you bolted them together like a giant Lego toy. But pickups were just basically down and dirty work tools for decades. And then about in, around 1970, uh, two things started to go mainstream. One was country music, and the other was um, pickup trucks, this whole urban cowboy thing. In 1970, you know, the Glen Campbell Good Time Hour went on the uh, air, and um, then the Johnny Cash show. And pickups sort of got to be this hip urban cowboy um, uh, thing. And they, um, um, in country music with Loretta Lynn, um, uh, you know, and Johnny Cash and Glenn Campbell sort of, it, it all sort of went mainstream simultaneously. What's remarkable to me is how, since we're in Washington, uh, how pickup trucks have taken on uh, political symbolism. Um, so in 2010, uh, when Scott Brown, the Republican, won that special election in Massachusetts to replace the late Senator Ted Kennedy, he sort of made his name by driving around the state in a pickup truck, that was his symbol. Uh, on the night he won, President Obama called to offer congratulations, and the first words that Senator-elect Brown, Senator Brown said, uh, says, well, thank you, Mr. President, would you like me to drive the truck down to Washington so you can see it? Mm -hmm. um, Ten months later, we had the midterm congressional elections, and there's uh, a guy running for Congress in Tennessee, and he identifies, he advertises himself in his ads as a truck driving, crime fighting, shotgun shooting, Bible reading, family loving country boy. <laughs> he was a Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> he lost, by the way. <laughs> there, we have a question right there in the two, two. So a third row and then the second row. Paul, what, what company builds the best cars on the road today, do you think? And which companies, looking down 10, 20, 30 years from now, do you think will? still be around and which ones might not be? 
Boy, I, I can't even look five years down the road, um, Jeff, honestly. Um, you know, it's hard to buy a bad car today because, you know, competition has really put the quality standards so high. Um, uh, I'm actually amazed. I mean, you know, 20 years ago, Hyundai was a joke. They build great cars uh, today. Um, uh, in, in the, you know, in the mid, um, about six, seven, eight years ago, uh, Mercedes-Benz took a real tumble in quality. Remember that they had that old misadventure with Chrysler when they bought Chrysler and they, they screwed up Chrysler and screwed up Mercedes at the same time. But they, their quality has really come back a lot. Um, uh, you know, uh, Toyota took a quality hit when they tried to get too big too fast. So, uh, you know, I think when you ask who, who makes the best cars, that changes really every few years because, you know, companies are like people. They get distracted, they go astray, then they repent, you know, and it just <laughs> happens like that. Um, so uh, the other part of your question was who's going to be in business 20, 30 years from now? Um, I don't know who's going to be in the car business. Uh, you know, I mean, look, Ford Motor Company has existed 100 years. General Motors is, uh, was almost wiped out a couple years ago. I wouldn't be surprised, though, if there's some new entrants that really capture this fusion between um, electronics and, uh, you know, consumer electronics and automobiles, intelligent electronics and automobiles. Um, I'm not sure the Chinese are going to be a midterm presence in emerging in, in developed markets soon. Their cars just aren't good enough yet. Okay. What do you see ahead for electric cars? You know, that is a great question. Um, I see futility. <laughs> mm. I mean, uh, it's no, you know, gas is what, $4 a gallon these days, right? And so why is General Motors closing the plant that builds the Chevy Volt for five weeks? Because sales aren't good enough. So how do you explain that dichotomy? And the answer, I think, is uh, essentially Internal combustion engines with modern engine controls, uh, start-stop start technology, um, lightweight materials, and all that sort of thing. You can buy a regular gasoline engine car for $22,000, $25,000 that gets more than 40 miles a gallon on the highway. And so an electric car can give you modestly more, right, sometimes. But on the other hand, you have this thing that the auto industry calls range anxiety. Anybody know what range anxiety is? That's the fear that you're going to run out of juice, you know, midway between point A and point B. Um, so I think hybrids will probably have a brighter future than electrics for a while. The technology simply isn't there to, to ease people's concerns about them. Okay, we'll have a question there. One of the big stories in this area is the Silver Line Metro Rail to Dulles, mm -hmm. bringing rail out to Dulles Airport. It, Paul, you entitle your book Engines of Change. It doesn't actually say in the title cars. Do you think transit also could be an engine of change? Um, well, it sort of is, I think, Myrne, in a lot of ways, to be honest with you. Um, but yeah, it's, I mean, you know, if you look at Chicago, for example, for years you didn't have the, uh, the L go out to the O'Hare Airport, so you had to get a taxi out there. Now you can get the L all the, out, all the way out to the airport. The freeways are still jammed. I can't explain that, by the way. Uh, but sure, I mean, transit, I think, is a, has a place in, a, in, in all, our, all of our big cities and a dominant place in all of our big cities. But the truth is, people still want personal transportation. That's why Zipcar is so popular. And there's a lot of places outside the cities where it's just not practical. We have time for, how about two, two more? Yeah, Paul, do you, do you expect the SUV will be around in 20 years, or was this sort of a temporary phenomenon of, of cheap gas prices? Um, yeah, I, I think the SUV will be radically different. I mean, SUVs to me are like um, the tail fins of the 50s. We're going to look back and we're going to say, what were we thinking? Okay. Um, uh, it's, um, it's, they have this sort of remote, a lot of it was a fashion statement, to be honest with you. I mean, the same people that wanted to, you know, go around wearing, um, uh, you, know, uh, you know, plaid flannel shirts from L.L. Bean and duster coats from, you know, the J. Peterman catalog. I mean, it was the perfect thing to, to have to sort of show you were an outdoorsman, even though, you know, maybe going outdoors just meant going through the drive through window at Taco Bell or something. I don't know. Uh, uh, so I, I think that SUVs will, will be a passing fad. I actually think minivans are very practical, though, and if they can be made somehow, if you can get over this whole soccer mom image of minivans, you know, they can hold a lot of people. They're very fuel efficient. The future lies that way, I think. Let's go up there and then over here, and then. 
Paul, you, you talk about all the successes. I'm curious as to how you would view, uh, why is the Etzel viewed of all the failures in the auto industry? Why is the Etzel kind of out, seemingly out there by itself? Well, you know, I just sort of passed into the culture that way, uh, Larry, to be honest with you. I think uh, part of it, it was, it was a, such a spectacular failure. It, it failed. It was hard to make a car fail in the, in the, in the mid-50s, let's put it that way. Um, that's when the Edsel came out. It was introduced in 57. It was died in, in 59, um, killed in 59. Um, and it was such a spectacular failure. It almost cost Ford Motor Company its existence. Um, it, you know, people used to laugh at it because that horse collar grill and, and all that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, and sadly, Edsel Ford, who was um, uh, Henry Ford's son who died at an early age, was, was a real, a, a marvelous man and executive in many ways. And, and frankly, um, you know, Henry could have used some of his son's attributes, but um, it sort of tarred his name with, the, you know, the, the image of failure forever. Uh, ironically, the um, you know they hired um, uh, Marianne Moore before they named that car. They they hired Marianne Moore, who was a, um, a prize-winning. She was I think the, the Nobel. Uh, she was a, no, the poet laureate of the United States to suggest names, and she had these weirdo names like you know Utopian Turtle Top and <laughs> Varsity Stroke and Silver Sword, and um, so no wonder they named it the Edsel after all that. <laughs> oh, uh, on the. President Eisenhower's investment in the interstate highway system, mm -hmm. I think, was very critical in the 50s. Um, you were talking about future trends, and I was wondering if our country will ever see that kind of investment again in infrastructure, let's say, for intelligent uh, highways, intelligent roadways that could have a dramatic effect on the types of cars designed. Yeah, I think, I think we probably will. I don't, I don't know who's going to pay for it. <laughs> Maybe the Chinese will pay for it. Um, uh, I think I think that we probably will. It, it'll probably take a few years. Uh, the technology isn't isn't really there yet, and it'll be um, it, it'll be tried out as experiments in a few places. But if you go back into the um, you know the history of the interstate highways, I mean that even though that program was started in the in the mid 50s, the first urban freeway actually is this about a two mile stretch of road in Detroit called the Davison Freeway. I mean it goes from you know, given the state of Detroit, the inner city of Detroit these days, it goes from nowhere to nowhere. But that's how the urban freeway and then the whole freeway system first caught on. We have time for two more questions. So we're going to go up there first and then this row right here. Go ahead, sir. Uh, can you discuss the impact of uh, auto racing on car marketing, car design, and is auto racing losing its influence in selling cars? Hmm. Well, yeah, I think it's probably, to some extent, I don't, I don't think auto racing is... Um, uh, captures, uh, there's so many other sports uh, distractions and leisure time distractions that people have. Uh, but on the other hand, people who, people who are passionate about racing do tend to be trendsetters, if you will, and other people follow them. So, uh, you know, the old saying in the auto business was, uh, win on Sunday, sell on Monday. And there's still something to that. People like performance and they want to go fast. And, um, but it's, it's certainly not the pervasive impact that it used to, used to have. Final question right here. Uh, PBS had a program a little while back called America Revealed. And uh, in it, they showed a new Volkswagen factory in Tennessee that produced, the, so they said, 500 cars per day. And it was done mostly by robots. So I wondered what your view is on what effect robots will have on the car industry in the future. Well, robots are, have already had a huge effect on the car industry, but the, the key word um, is mostly, okay? Uh, you, still need, you still need people to, to manage those robots, and you still need people to um, uh, assemble those cars and do the things that robots uh, can't do. So uh, it's already had, a, the, if you went back 40 years uh, or, or so, a, a typical factory that built 500 cars a day would have 6,000 uh, workers in it. Now it'll probably have about 1,800 workers in it. So it's already been a profound effect, and there'll be more of that. But every time, frankly, and every time the auto industry has tried to sort of push this whole robotic thing too far, I mean, the classic thing was um, in the mid-'80s, General Motors built this factory of the future in, in, in Detroit uh, filled with all kinds of robots and this and that, and uh, the, the, the I, I helped cover that at the time when I was with the Journal, and the, 
most memorable incident was when the, the robots sort of went berserk. The spray painting robots went berserk. <laughs> they started spray painting each other instead of the cars. I kid they not. <laughs> and Paul, dare we ask what kind of car you drive? Want to reveal it to us? I drive a red one. Okay. <laughs> Good enough. Paul and Grassi, ladies and gentlemen, the, bo the book is Engines of Change. Thank you. Thanks. Once again, uh, copies are available on sale right outside the studio here, and Paul will be kind enough to probably answer more questions and also sign copies of the book. Tomorrow, uh, if you're in, in town, Inside Media, we have uh, New York Times media reporter Brian Stelter uh, talking about new media. It'll be 2.30 right here in this very same studio. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. How did I go?